It is the 17th of October 2000 and the news in the UK is once again flooded with reports of a fatal rail disaster. Almost to the year since Ladbroke Grove, which itself was only two years after another fatal disaster. The 17th largest and reportedly fifth most used railway network in the world is dealing with yet another crash in a very bloody few years. Once again emergency workers are picking over wrecked train carriages. Today only one train involved. At least that offers some relief as a search for casualties, as the tangled mess is somewhat lessened. The site is Hatfield, and the line they are working on is the East Coast Main Line, a vital artery in the country's rail network. My name is John, and welcome to Plainly Difficult. Background. So I've only been on the East Coast Main Line two times in my life, on a journey to Edinburgh and back. It's a great route which takes you through some really iconic British cities and countrysides. For example, York and Newcastle springs to mind. But today's accident location is nowhere near all the stunning views. Instead, it is within spitting distance of London and only a 10 minute journey up from Potter's Bar which would have its own disaster just a year after today's video subject. And there's a link to that video around here. I should say that the East Coast Main Line has had its fair share of crashes. Further down the line is the infamous Morpeth Curve, which will also likely be a future video. Anyways, today we are hovering around Hatfield in Hertfordshire, which is around here on a map. There has been a station here since the 1850s. It sees both stopping commuter services as well as fast, non-stop intercity trains whizzing through. The route is arranged with fast and slow lines running alongside one another. So up slow and fast which runs to London and down slow and fast which runs away from London. Over the years during the East Coast Main Line's history it received electrification. This was between 1976 and 1991. The upgrade increased train efficiency, as the previously steam and later diesel loco hauled services had slower acceleration and required all the usual gubbins that went along with it. It was electrified to the UK overhead line standard voltage of 25 kilovolts of AC. As such, in the early 1990s when the upgrade was complete, the types of trains that applied the route changed to electrical multiple units and AC powered locomotive hauled trains and one such train was the Intercity 225 locomotive and Mark IV carriages. Now these trains were hauled by class 91 locomotives. Built between 1989 and 1991, the train sets are a rather interesting thing for UK railways, as they look like there is a locomotive at each end, or even that they kind of look like an Intercity electric multiple unit. But they are neither. They are in fact a push-pull setup in which the locomotive is at one end with a driving van trailer at the other. They are capable of speeds up to 225 km an hour, hence the name. British Rail advertised the sets under this name, which is odd for UK railways as at the time, and still today, our railways are signposted in miles per hour. But I suppose 225 sounds more impressive than the mile per hour equivalent of 140. Which again is pointless, as in reality the trains don't go faster than 125 miles an hour due to the constraints of the non-cab based four aspect signalling standard across UK railways, which is so much further behind than other countries' high speed rail systems. What also really bugs me as well is that the previous intercity trains were marketed as the Intercity 125, i.e. 125 miles an hour in the 1970s. Okay, I'm sorry, but not really sorry about the diversion. Right, so the Class 91 and their Mark IV coaches were built at the time to the most modern standard of passenger comfort and safety standards, including steel body shells. They are pretty good train sets. Well, I at least enjoyed them and travelling on an LNER service to Edinburgh back in 2019. The fast line through Hatfield has a maximum speed of 115 miles an hour. Around the implementation of privatisation of British Rail, track maintenance was taken over by an organisation called Railtrack. This was a group of companies that owned and maintained the tracks, signalling tunnels, bridges, level crossings and nearly all the stations of the British Railway network. The country is split up into different zones, 
of which the East Coast Main Line was part of the London North Eastern Zone, responsible for over 1,900 passenger trains a day. Railtrack subcontracted out different jobs to different companies. One such was Balfour Betty, and this was for track maintenance. Part of the track maintenance is the replacement of metals when they reach their maximum operating life. You see, track over the thousands and thousands of heavy, fast-moving trains becomes susceptible to fatigue cracking as the rails flex and move under the tremendous strain. If they're just left in lieu of replacement, they will eventually crack, completely breaking the rail, which can be catastrophic if undiscovered. Until repair works are done, trains have to be slowed right down, usually by the implementation of an emergency speed restriction. If not, then a rail can splinter under the weight and speed of trains. But nothing can be done if it is not discovered. This is where ultrasonic testing, test trains and visual inspections come into play, all of which rely on the experience of the operators. Issues of broken rail was well known by Railtrack in the late 1990s, when they would even say during a London North Eastern Zone Committee meeting, this would require a high level of physical activity, planning, management and monitoring and would be critical in the event of a fatality caused by a broken rail. It would seem that the infrastructure was breaking down and broken rails on very fast lines were becoming even more common. In May 1999, Railtrack triggered a broken rail plan for the East Coast Main Line. This would hope to incentivize repair and replacement of rail, but by November, it wasn't going so good. Again, as noted in a committee meeting. I am particularly concerned that the number of broken rails and the condition of track in some locations is proving an intolerable risk. Anecdotally, I've chatted with train drivers who worked during the rail track period, and most say the numbers of emergency, blanket and temporary speed restrictions were frustratingly high. It seems like there was a game of broken rail whack-a-mole. Luckily, no serious accidents had happened, but not for too much longer. This video is sponsored by Private Internet Access. PIA, a virtual private network, is an application that hides your IP address and safeguards your internet connection through an encrypted tunnel. This way, it shields your digital life from the eyes of those who are looking to exploit and take your private information. Using the internet without PIA is like having a garden with no lawnmower. I use public Wi-Fi a lot as I'm out and about, and having a VPN is essential as it protects your information from anyone on the same Wi-Fi network with bad intentions, as they could have the ability to steal your personal data with ease, including sensitive information such as passwords, keystrokes, and even your personal photographs, although no one would actually want any of my photographs. PIA also has the ability for you to change your IP address to any one of their 91 different countries, which is good when you want to buy things from another country and get local prices. It's also good if you use streaming services which have region locked content, and not only can you change your IP address to a different country, you can even pretend to be in any of all 50 US states allowing you to gain access to websites and services that are only available locally. PIA works on all major platforms, and now you can use one private internet access subscription to protect an unlimited number of devices at the same time. So to check out PIA, go to www.piavpn.com slash plainly difficult to get 83% off private internet access with four months for free. Now, let's get back to the video. The Disaster it is around lunchtime on the 17th of October 2000, and a trainee driver and their instructor are boarding their train for the afternoon. It is an Intercity 225. Although no longer in the Intercity colours, the train is now operated by the private operator Great North Eastern Railway. It's made up of a Class 91 locomotive, 8 Mark IV passenger carriages, a buffet car and a driving van trailer. Today, they're scheduled to travel to Leeds, along that stubby diverging route off the East Coast Main Line. The train's head code is 1 Delta 38. Just as a geeky side note, the one at the beginning of the head code means express train or a fast train, just so you know. Anyways, train 1 Delta 38 departs King's Cross at roughly 10 minutes past 12. It makes steady progress, making its way onto the down fast line. On board, there are 10 GNER staff and around 100 passengers. The train speed is steady, around the line speed of 115 miles an hour. 
At around 12.22pm, the train is around 16 miles from King's Cross, as it is approaching a piece of curved track between Wellham Green and Hatfield. At 12.23pm, the left-hand running line of the down fast begins to shatter. The locomotive and first two carriages pass over the cracked track. The train continues to thunder over the broken rail. Next coaches C, D, E and F then run over the damaged section and became derailed, increasing the rail fragmentation. The eighth vehicle in the train set was a restaurant coach. It overturned and struck an overhead line gantry, crushing its roof. The first eight carriages continued to move forward, in doing so dragging the buffet car into another overhead line mast. The train has split, with the last three carriages coming to rest 200 metres to the rear. Once all the vehicles had come to stop, the driver made the necessary calls to the signaller and the guard made use of his mobile phone to call GNER control. The overhead lines were switched off, however power can still run through the lines for quite a while after. The guard helped evacuate passengers safely from the train, and within 10 minutes the first emergency workers had arrived on scene. There were a lot of injured passengers, but sadly four would die in the crash, all of whom were aboard the destroyed buffet car. Their names were Robert James Alkin, Stephen Arthur, Leslie Gray and Peter Monkhouse. In addition to this, there would be 70 officially wounded people. The Aftermath Investigators from the BTP, HSC and HMRI were dispatched to the crash site, and they would find some very concerning hints at what had caused the disaster. Initially during the first search, it was found, as said in the HSC Interim 48 Hours report, there is obvious signs of significant evidence of rail failure. There is evidence of significant metal fatigue damage to the rails in the vicinity of the derailment. The only evidence to date of wheel damage is consistent with wheels hitting defective track. This pointed the finger away from a train borne defect towards the track. Quickly the way the train was operated was ruled out as a contributory factor as well as signalling or point work issues. During the initial observations of the crash site, a theory of rolling contact fatigue was posited, where multiple small cracks along a rail eventually manifest into a full-blown failure. The damaged parts of the suspect rail were reassembled by investigators, and as you can see here, there were multiple areas where the track had essentially disintegrated. The section of rail had fractured into over 300 pieces over a distance of 35 metres. In addition to this, another section of rail 44 metres along the line was fragmented for a length of 54 metres. It was pretty obvious from the get-go that the rail had fragmented and it was the cause of the crash. But why? Well, it came down to high stress fatigue of heavy fast moving trains. You see, when a train's wheels rolls over rails, the huge benefit of railways become its Achilles heel. This is due to this small amount of contact that a train actually makes with the rail, which is great for reducing friction, but it focuses a lot of pressure on just a small point of metal. Eventually over time, the repeated passion of trains and thus their wheels the high contact pressures will cause the formation of crack-like floors, which, if undetected, become small cracks, which will then eventually end up in fracturing. This phenomenon is very well known in the rail industry, which is why it's vital that life-expired track is removed and, in use, track is regularly inspected. This leads us on to the true cause and is sadly down to the culprits, cost saving. Railtrack, as we saw earlier on in the video, knew there were issues on the East Coast Main Line. They had, after all, put in motion their broken rail plan. This, along with the internal memos, all came to light. Post privatisation, Railtrack had subbed out a lot of its work, of which one was Balfour Betty. It was discovered that the company had not been fulfilling its responsibilities. Reports of damaged track were not followed up upon. Staff were not being trained to be able to effectively operate ultrasonic testing equipment. And on top of all of that, a lot of track workers employed by Balfour Betty were not even taught how to visually identify even obvious track defects. Even if they did, though reports were not passed up through management, and even then, when non-compliance of track standards were found, the company didn't do anything to improve staff performance. 
In the end, the whole event would be one of the nails in the rail track coffin in the eyes of the government and the public. Legal and civil proceedings would be brought against Railtrack and Balfour Betty. In 2003, the two companies, well, Railtrack's successor, Network Rail, were charged with breach of health and safety rules and manslaughter. In addition, five managers were also charged with the same charges. However, in court, the jury were instructed to not find guilty on any of the manslaughter charges. This resulted in Balfour Betty changing its plea from not guilty to guilty. The five managers would later be acquitted of all charges. But Network Rail was found guilty of health and safety rule violations in September 2005. Balfour Betty and Network Rail were fined £10 million and £3.5 million respectively, although the former was reduced on appeal down to £7.5 million. Interestingly, these were the highest health and safety related fines since the Paddington crash in 1999. In the aftermath, thousands of temporary speed restrictions would blight commuters' journeys, as Railtrack frantically tried to stop a repeat of Hatfield. But we know it wouldn't be the last rail-based disaster in the area. And check out my video on Potter's Bar for that one, which was just a few miles away. The locomotive would be repaired and put back into use, where just four months later it would be involved in another accident in which 10 people would die. So scale time. It's going to be a four, but it could have been much worse if another train was nearby. And this is what I've got for my bingo card. This is a Plain Difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plain Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in the currently sunny corner of Southern London, UK. I have a second YouTube channel, Instagram, and Twitter, or X, or whatever the hell you want to call it, so check out all that stuff for extra odds and sods of bits and pieces I'm getting up to. I'd like to say a very big thank you to my Patreon and YouTube members, as well as the rest of you who tune in every week to watch my videos. And all that's left to say is thank you for, thank you for watching, and Mr Music, play us out please. <laughs>